name is Hans George Campbell, and I'm out in my shop tonight. And I figured I'd go ahead and do part one of my Apple IIe pickup. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> a friend of mine suggested that I try doing like a Mr. Rogers type introduction. And so I thought I'd do that tonight in this video. And you guys tell me what you think in the comments section, okay? So I'm putting on my Amiga hat. Gotta have this on. Okay? Gotta have my Amiga hat on. Yeah. Alright, and then I gotta put on my anti-static smock. We don't want to zap any electronics with static electricity. Okay, remember damage by static electricity is the number one cause of component failure. Okay? Remember that. So, it's important to practice uh, ESD, you know, proper ESD safety procedures. I'm going to take a sip of my coffee first because my throat's kind of getting dry. sip my delicious coffee here. Yeah, my videos, I'm thinking, I don't like my videos being so, I mean, like a TV show or whatever, you know, I prefer that uh, they're more relaxed, you know, to where it's like you're actually standing here in front of me or sitting here, you know, and, and, and I'm talking to you or, you know, and uh, that's the way I prefer to do my videos. And I think that you guys will enjoy them more, you know, this way. But anyway, let's get started here. Um, this is the Apple Monitor 3 that I got with that Apple IIe computer pickup. And I found some stuff on the Internet. Okay, it is a 12-inch green phosphor CRT-based monochrome monitor. Now, there was also a white phosphor CRT-based monochrome monitor. And I love the final one of those, because I actually don't like the green. I, I, would prefer, I would prefer the white instead of the green. But I bet those white ones are very hard to find. Okay, the monitor was made in Japan by Hitachi. A lot of people seem to think that the monitor was made by Sanyo, but no, that's not true. Uh, at least not for this monitor. This monitor was made in Japan by Hitachi. Um, these are NTSC only. There are no PAL versions of this monitor. They're, NT, they're strictly NTSC. The monitor was introduced in 1980, but no one seems to know when the monitor was discontinued. I think that it had about a 12-year run. Okay, I think it was discontinued in the late 80s uh, or early 90s is when I think this monitor was finally put to rest. All right. Um, the original price of this monitor, and this was back in 1980, okay, was $400. That was a lot of money back in 1980, you know, 400 bucks for this monitor. A monitor stand for the Monitor 3 was available from Apple to accommodate the narrower width of the Apple II case, okay, which I'm going to show next. Okay, um, but yeah, um, the monitor has like some kind of a black screen mesh on the front of the CRT screen. I guess it's like for anti-glare. Uh, and um, there is your Apple logo and the name badge and your 
contrast knob and your power switch. And my monitor here, it has it's been scratched up here. I mean, it's got a little some the paint is flaked off around here in this area. Now, what surprises me is how this was done without damaging the black this black screen mesh here because it's like a plastic mesh. How is this uh, scuffed up without the mesh being affected? You know, so I thought that was weird. <laughs> but anyway, what I'm planning on doing <clears throat> is I'm going to take this monitor completely apart. I'm taking everything out of the case, including the CRT picture tube. And these pop out. I don't have to worry about masking those because they pop out. And then I'm going to wash and rinse this case, and I'm going to let it air dry overnight. And then I'm going to mask off around the brown because I don't want the beige getting painted. And I'm going to put a couple of real light coats of brown spray paint. I'm going to you know, spray paint this and touch all this up. And when I get finished, it'll look like brand new again. It really will. Um, I have the a color of this, like it's like a cinnamon brown paint or whatever, satin brown paint that very closely matches this original um, color. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, but yeah, and then I'll put the monitor back together. I'm probably not going to replace this black screen mesh. I don't like it. I'd much rather just have the regular CRT glass there. So it'd be easier to keep it clean and, you know, I don't know. We'll see. But I'm going to recap the monitor. You know, I'm going to blow out the dust, and when it's all put back together, I'm going to tweak some of the, I'll make some fine adjustments on it, because these old monitors, the old CRT monitors, they do have to be readjusted or fine-tuned after all these years, you know, and, yeah. And, of course, I'm going to show all of that under the camera, in front of the camera, so you guys get to watch me do, do that, but, yeah. So, this is the monitor, well, the front of it. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it around, okay, I'll turn it around, and and you get to see, you know, the back of the monitor. Okay, so this is the back of this Apple Monitor 3, and of course that's your power cord, that's your video input, composite input. It's got three adjustment knobs down here on the bottom, that's always nice. And it says here, on the label, it says made in Japan, made for Apple Computer Incorporated by Hitachi. It actually says it right there on the label. For those of you that think that this monitor was made by Sanyo, no, they were made by Hitachi. It says it right there on the label. Made in Japan by Hitachi. Okay, as was a lot of monitors um, from this time period. Uh, the famous Commodore 1701 and 1702 monitors is a fine example of what I'm talking about. Those monitors were also made in Japan by Hitachi. So, yeah, Tashi made a lot of monitors back then, you know, during this, uh, the early 80s to mid 80s uh, time period. Because I think the Commodore uh, 1801, 1802 monitors were made in Japan by Hitachi. Uh, the 1902s and the 2002s, they were made um, in Japan by Hitachi. I'm talking about the ones that, that were in the uh, 1080 style case. Uh, those earlier, the early uh, 1900s and the 2002s, and, and also some of the 1084s and 1084s Commodore monitors in the 1080 style cases, because I have one uh, hooked up to my one of my Mi 1200 computers. Those were all made in Japan by Hitachi. Okay, so this is the monitor right here. I'll go ahead and put this away. But interesting to know, okay, you notice that it's got a built-in handle right here. And I think this is where Apple got the idea to 
I mean, for, you know, for the handle <coughs> for their early Macintosh computers, because their early Macintosh computers have a similar style handle, you know. So I, I thought that was that was interesting. So we'll take this down, and we're gonna put it right here. I don't want to get scratched up. Here is the monitor stand for the um, that monitor, <coughs> and basically the inside part right here is just barely bigger than the Apple II computers because the monitor is a little bit longer than the actual computer. And so Apple decided to come out with these nice little stands here. It's made out of you know thick plastic, and they got rubber feet on the bottom. See, it's got rubber feet down there on the bottom, so it doesn't slide. And then it's got this this um, indent in here, or whatever that is. And the feet, the four feet from the monitor, fit in there perfectly. So the monitor it positions where the monitor should go, and it doesn't slide off, you know. But yeah, there's the other uh, stand for that monitor. Now, I see a lot of people, um, they, they like to put the disk drives on here first, and then the monitor. I mean, even Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, uh, I saw a picture of them doing the same thing. And a lot of people have done this. But I'm here to tell you that that's the wrong way to do it. Don't do that. And I've, just, and I've seen people actually put the disk drives directly on the computer and then the monitor on top. Don't do that. Don't do that. Okay? The correct way to set up the Apple II computer, including the Apple IIe, okay, is you slide the computer underneath this monitor stand, or you put this monitor stand over the computer, right? You put your monitor on top, okay, and you set your disk drives either on the right-hand side. Well, if I'm looking at it this way, I guess this would be the right-hand side. <laughs> this would be the left-hand side. Wait, wait, okay. This would be the right-hand side. Okay, let me get it straight. And this would be the left-hand side. Okay, we got that straight now. I got turned around. Okay. Um, depending if you're right-handed or left-handed. And that's the proper way to set up the Apple II computers. You don't have the drives sitting on top and then the monitors sitting on top of the drives. Don't do that. Okay? Just don't do it. Take it from me. But anyway, this is the monitor stand for that um, for that monitor. Alright, so the next thing I want to show you um This here is the, the manual to that monitor. I don't know how well you can see it, but that's the, the manual for the Apple Monitor 3. And uh, when I show it, when, when I do the video showing all the manuals that I've gotten for the Apple II computers and Apple IIe, then I'll show this in more detail. But for now, in this pickup video, I just want to show the front of the manual. So that's it for the uh, the monitor. Um, next, we'll take a look at two of the disk drives that I got in this Apple II E pickup. <clears throat> okay. Next, we have the Apple II Disk Two. Um, with its instruction manual. Okay. Um, the Apple Disk II was designed by Steve Wozniak. Um, it was introduced in June of 1978. Um, it originally sold for a price of $595. But that include, included the controller card. 
So, yeah, you got the disk drive and the controller card for $595. Okay. Um, so, we got the front of the disk drive here. We got the LED, got some labels, got the nice Apple logo. I like that large Apple logo. And this here is a shoe guard mechanism. Um, yeah, it's a shoe guard mechanism. Uh, it's basically a stripped down uh, shoe guard mechanism. It has a lot of the electronics on the board removed because Steve Wozniak didn't need any of that electronics uh, to you know, to, to make this um, disk drive work with his Apple II computer. Okay. Um, he designed, basically, I think it had like four chips, a four-chip controller for these drives. And, um, and so, yeah, Steve Wozniak actually designed, you know, this disk drive. And it's a simple device. Now, this particular one, this is the one that came with my Apple IIe. It has, as you can see here, a gray um, ribbon cable with the connector on and all that. But the early, the early Apple II drive, or disc II drives, um, they had a rainbow colored ribbon cable. The early versions, or, or early releases of this drive had a um, a rainbow colored uh, ribbon cable. So that's how you can tell if you got an early issue or a newer version. I like the newer one better because the cable seems to be thicker, more durable uh, than the rainbow cable, but it's stiffer too. You know, it's not as, as flexible as a rainbow ribbon cable, rainbow colored uh, ribbon cable. Um, yeah. <coughs> so that's the front of the drive. I'll show the manual in a moment. Okay, so that's the front of the drive. And this here is the rear of the drive. Okay. And this is the bottom of the drive. And, and mine's in pretty nice shape. Well, actually, let me put it this way so you can see it all in the camera. <laughs> but yeah, mine's in pretty nice shape. I just need to give it a little sponge bath and yeah, it'd be like brandy. Maybe stick a head cleaning disc in there, you know, clean the heads. But uh, yeah, a little shoe guard mechanism. And then this works like that. Okay. Now, I, I remember when I built my first um, IBM PC XT compatible computer in the early 80s, I installed a couple of, a couple of these shoe guard mechanisms, these shoe guard disk drives, in that computer. And I, I remember that to this day. That's how I remember these shoe guard drives. You know. uh, but mine actually had the IBM logo over here, it is in, it is molded into the plastic. I think it was here or up here where it said IBM. And, uh, you yeah, know, those drives were not cheap. They were expensive. I remember that. They were, they were expensive. Yeah. But anyway, that's the Apple Disk 2 disk drive. And I'm going to show you the manual next. Okay. So, this here is the manual. I'm not going to show the inside. In fact, let me raise the camera up a little bit. I didn't realize how low it was, you know. Raise this camera up just a little bit. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Anyway, that's the manual um, to this disk drive. I thought I'd show it. I'm not going to show the inside, but I am going to, going to do a video where I show all of my different Apple manuals in, in more detail. Uh, later on, uh, but for now I just want to show you the front in this 
Alpha 2E pickup video. Anyway, there's a manual to that drive. Okay. Well, next I'll show you a a third-party drive, uh, disk drive that came uh, with my Alps 2 e pickup. <clears throat> okay, this is that third-party disk drive that I was telling you about. It's uh, it was made for the Apple II series computers, and it looks very similar to Apple's own disk drive. Uh, this one was made by I believe Micro. Uh, dash SCI, and the name of this disk drive is, um, let me see, U dash SCI. I thought it was a really weird name for a drive, but that's the name of this drive. And you've got your LED right there, power LED. You've got your label, and this I use as drive two. And then got your lever. Same shoe guard mechanism is what was used in the Apple drive. So, yeah. Same thing. I haven't cleaned this drive yet. That's why it's got some dust on it or whatever. But I plan on cleaning, uh, cleaning this drive. Anyway, um, that's the, the front of the drive right there. And that's the side. Okay. And that's the back, similar style gray ribbon cable, only this is a little bit more flexible. It's not as thick as the one that's on the Apple drive. There's the back. And then there's the bottom of the drive. I don't know what's going on with that, with that label that's on there, but there's the bottom of the drive. And as you can see, it's pretty nice. I mean, the feet are still in pretty good shape. and. Yeah, the drive. This drive looks almost brand new. If it weren't for the dust, it looks brand new. It really does. Okay, and this right here is the manual. I'm not going to show you the inside of the manual. I'll do that uh, when I show all the manuals. But for now, I just, I just want to show you the front of the manual, what it looks like. But that's the manual for that third-party Apple II um, disk drive. Okay, so next I'm going to show you the actual Apple IIe computer. Alrighty, this is my Apple II e computer that I, that I got in. Um, it's a really nice computer. It's a really nice shape. Here's your Apple logo and the two e logo. And uh, a friend of mine told me, like I said before, a friend of mine told me that uh, this was an earlier issue of the Alp 2E because it has the white characters on top of the keys. And I thought that was interesting. So I thought I'd mention that in this in this video. But yeah, it's in a really nice shape. Um, the color of the case I think is about the same as my Alp 2 Plus because I'm looking at it behind me. So they appear to be about the same color. You know, um, yeah. So, yeah, that's the, uh, my Alp 2E. Now, the guy that originally owned this computer, for some reason, he drilled two holes here. I don't know why he did that. But, um, yeah. I don't like holes drilled in these vintage computer cases because they're getting hard to find in a really nice shape like this, so... This case would have been perfect if not for those two holes that were drilled into the case. But I'm going to make use of those holes because they, those could be status indicators. Okay, I've got some five millimeter 
LED clips that, I don't know if you can see this on the camera or not, but um, basically they're LED holders and they go through the hole and they clip in and then the LED goes in from the other side and there's like fish hook clips that grab hold of that LED. Okay, so and these fit these holes that this guy drilled perfectly. It's almost as if he drilled them with, uh, you know, with this in mind. But, okay, there is a, a red LED on the motherboard. I don't know why it's there, because you can't see it when the case is all closed up. You're using the computer. It's a 5-volt status LED. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to unsolder that LED, and I'm going to solder on a 2-pin header. Okay, and then I'll have the 5-volt status LED right here, red LED right there, with a wire that will plug into that 2-pin header. Okay, and over here I'm going to have a yellow LED because I have, let me, uh, it's over here sitting on my workbench. I have this, um, this uh, Microsoft soft card, which is a Z80 processor card. It allows you to run uh, CPM programs on your Apple II computer. And if you notice, it too has an LED right here that comes on when the Z80 processor is being accessed, when it's being used. This LED comes on. Well, again, that's stupid because it's inside the computer. You can't see that LED. So I'm going to unsolder this LED from this board and put in a two pin header. And again, I'm going to have a yellow LED over here with a wire so you know, a couple wires soldered on and a plug that'll plug into that two pin header. So this LED will be the 5 volt status LED. It'll be red. And this LED will come on whenever the Z80 card is being accessed, it's being used. Um, that yellow LED will start coming on. It will come on when this board's being used. Because I do plan on using this board. I plan on showing a lot of early uh, CPM games and CPM programs from that time period. You know, I think it'll be very nostalgic for some of you. Uh, others, you'll probably find it boring. You know, I've got all kinds of video content that I'm going to be posting on this YouTube channel. I mean, the vintage computer related and, of course, video games. So, you just got to basically watch what you're interested in. But I'm going to put all kinds of computer related and software related videos on my YouTube channel. So, just watch whatever you, whatever you want to watch. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to put this back. All right. So, yeah. So now I'm going to pop off this lid. It comes off like that. And it's kind of neat. It has this like metal braid here. It's like stapled on onto this plastic. I guess that's for your grounding, this, this stuff here. And this case is really nice. It's a really thick. I mean, the whole case is like, it's a really thick, almost like a fiberglass, but it's a really thick, hard plastic, very similar to the Commodore PET computers. Their, their case is made the same way. It's got this really thick plastic for the top part, and then like the Apple computer, the it has a metal base okay, that the motherboard and power supply secures to. So the Apple II computer is made very much like the Commodore PET computer. And I'm wondering who copied who. I think since the Apple came out first, Commodore, I think, copied Apple's design. Um, but yeah, this is the motherboard uh, right here, and this is your, the power supply. And uh, this, I believe, is a mechanical keyboard. It has separate key switches, if I'm not mistaken. It's a really nice... Uh, keyboard. Um, all the chips are socketed, like the original Apple, Apple II, and, and Apple II Plus. All the chips here are socketed. 
they're all facing the same way and the resistors here are all facing the same way even the color codes are in the same direction Steve Wozniak was a stickler on the design of the board. He wanted that board laid out really nice. And, and, and him and I would have got along great because I'm the same way. I'm the exact same way. You know, so Steve Wozniak and I would have actually got along really well. And we, we would have wound up becoming great friends, you know, good friends, you know, if we would have worked together. And I never got a chance to work with him. Uh, but, yeah, I would have loved to because him and I would have been friends, yeah. Because I, we think a lot alike as far as this kind of stuff here, you know. But yeah, all the chips are socketed. Um, it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven expansion slots, and then it's got this slot here for your 80-column card and memory expansion, and these are your eight memory chips down here. Uh, the computer comes stock with, I believe, 64k of memory it can be expanded all the way up to one megabyte. In fact, um, Applied Engineering, I think that's the name of the company, Applied Engineering, uh, they produce a board that would allow you to expand this computer's memory all the way up to two and a half megabytes, which was a lot back then. That was unheard of back then. This, you have to remember, this computer came out in 1983 when most computers uh, had between 5K and 48K. Even 64K was not common. Okay? Not, not back in 1983. See? So for a computer like this, an 8-bit computer like this, to have 2.5 megabytes of memory, even 1 megabyte of memory, that was a lot of memory for an 8-bit computer. Okay? But, yeah. Um... And as you can see, there's a, a 5 volt status red LED right here. Well, that's a stupid place to put that. You know, that, that's what I'm thinking. So I'm going to unsolder that LED because I'm going to take this board out anyway and recap it. And of course, you guys get to see me do that underneath the camera. You know. And I'm going to solder in a 2 pin header. And then I'll have a wire that has a plug that plugs into that header soldered onto a red LED that will pop in. Uh, from underneath here, it'll pop in. So I have a red LED right here for the 5 volt status. And of course the yellow LED would be for my Z80 processor uh, when it's running, you know. Okay, this ribbon cable is for the keyboard. And then there's a speaker right down here. Um, the, the sound system in the Apple II computer is not very sophisticated. It's just a bunch of beeps and squawks and things like that. Uh, that's where the Commodore 64 computer just blew the doors off this computer. And that was sound. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, that's the inside of my Apple IIe computer. And so I thought I'd show it to you guys. All right. Um, okay. Let me see something. I think I also have the manual laying around somewhere for this computer. I just got to find it. Where did I put my manual? Uh, let's see. Super serial card? No, that's not it. <laughs> you know what? I can show the manual when I show the manuals. I'm going to do a separate video that shows all the manuals. So stay tuned for that. But yeah, that's it for my Apple IIe computer. Next, I'm going to show you the game paddles that I got with it and an early Apple joystick with its original manual. So, that's coming up next. Okay, before I show you the, the controllers that came with this Apple IIe computer, I thought that I would go ahead and show you the rear of this Apple IIe computer because I find it very interesting that it still has all of these covers here, the original covers. You know, now I got now I had a, a bunch of boards. Uh, there was a bunch of boards that were plugged into this computer. Almost every slot was filled with boards. 
and I'm going to show those boards in part two of this video series. Uh, but the guy kept all the original slide covers, so I decided just to pop them back on there, you know. Um, and yeah, I, I just thought that was interesting. I thought I'd show that to you. But anyway, this is the back of the power supply, back of the whole computer. Got your power switch, you got your cord plug. Um, this is for your joysticks or your controllers. Um, these two jacks are for the cassette, the cassette uh, tape player. Because before, you know, the disk drives, that's how you would load and save programs with this computer, is via cassette. And those of you from I mean that uh, they experienced the golden age of home computers back then. You'll know what I'm talking about because you probably use a cassette, well, like a data set with your VIC-20 or your Commodore 64 computer, or even you know some kind of a cassette player uh, with your 8-bit Apple, com uh, not Apple, but um, Atari computer. You know, so yeah, but that's for the the Apple cassette tape deck, and then this is your color. Color composite video output, right there. Color composite video input. Now, the Apple computers are color computers. Okay, so I often wonder to myself, okay, why did Apple produce and sell green screen monitors for these color computers? And a friend of mine seems to think it was because these computers were mainly used in schools and the schools didn't want the kids playing games on the computer. I mean they were more likely to, to be wanting to play games on a color monitor than on a green screen. Okay, green screen is for like serious work or school work, you know, or business or whatever. So, and I'm thinking that that's probably true. I don't know. Because the Commodore 64 computers were also in the school, in, you know, in the schools, and they were hooked up to color monitors. So I think that that was one of the biggest mistakes that Apple made was selling green monochrome displays with these color computers, and that was one of the reasons why the Commodore 64 was able to greatly outsell the Apple computers because. They always came with color monitors. The, both the Commodore 1701 and the 1702 uh, monitors, they were both made in Japan by Atashi, and they were both color monitors. And so if you were out to buy, I mean, you were going to buy a new computer, you know, which computer would you pick? They're basically the same price. Keep that in mind. Would you buy the Commodore 64 with full color monitor, or would you buy the Apple II computer with a green screen monitor? And that's the way the average consumer, most consumers, looked at it. And that's the reason why I think that the Commodore 64 computer was able to outsell the Apple II series. You know, I think uh, that green monochrome display that Apple seemed to be fond of, and they used for all their, almost their whole entire 8-bit computer line, that was one of their biggest mistakes that they made. They should have produced color monitors, and sold nothing but, you know, included color monitors with these computers from day one. And I think these computers would have done a lot better in sales. You know, I really do. But yeah, anyway, I thought I'd show you the back of this computer and I talked a little bit about the, uh, uh, the video, you know, green screen monitors and things like that. My thoughts about that. All right. So now for the, the controllers. Okay, these are the controllers that came with this Apple IIe uh, pickup, came in with this computer. Um, this is a pair of Kraft game paddles for the Apple II computers. And this is an early, uh, early issue of the Apple II joystick with its manual. And the way you can tell an early issue Apple joystick is that it will have a black handle, 
right here. And the inside here will be like a khaki color. Okay, and the rest of it is going to be this like beige tan color. And the manual will be just a black and white manual. Okay. Whereas the manual that is included with the later issues of the Apple joystick, it has a touch of red, like a red highlight on the front of this, this manual. And the stick here will be beige, like the rest of the, the joystick. And if memory serves me correctly, it will not have this, this khaki color here in the center. It will be the same color as the rest of the, the joystick body. So, yeah, both joysticks have the orange buttons, okay? Um, yeah, and of course, both joysticks have the Apple logo uh, molded into the plastic body. Okay, the last thing that I have to show in this first part of this video series, uh, you know, the Apple IIe pickup video series, is this head cleaning kit <clears throat> um, that I got with this pickup. Made by Scotch, or 3M. And we're going to take a look inside this. See what's inside this head cleaning kit. We've got... Um, well, we got this interesting top piece. This, I think, comes up like that. Where you can put a few drops. I think five drops onto the... Uh, they tell you where to put it on the disc. And these work really well. I use these all the time. I think it's easier to open and close this when you have this on the actual bottle. Anyway, there's the top. And then... Um, okay, there's no cleaning solution in this. <laughs> but there's the, uh, the bottle. It's supposed to have cleaning solution in it. So I'll get some more cleaning solution to fill that bottle up. And um, here are the, uh, the head cleaning instructions. You know, it shows you how to use this, you know. Okay, so there's the ins instructions. Okay, and then we have uh, a couple of these these um, these discs. There's two of them. Okay. So there's the front of the disc, and it has a label to where you mark off. Uh, you mark off on, on these labels, like up to 15 times. You can use these up to 15 times before they're no longer any good. You throw them in the garbage. So this is enough for 30 head cleanings. Okay. And then on the back is where you actually put um, the five drops of that cleaning fluid. And these work really well. I actually prefer to clean my drive heads like this instead of like what most how most of you do it. You know, you take the drive apart and you lift up the thing and you clean the head with a cotton swab with alcohol. No, I don't like doing it that way. Uh, I think this is a much more efficient way of doing it. And in fact, there are programs that you can get. Uh, for all the different computers, you know, including Amiga and, and Commodore, um, that actually it, it, that moves the heads back and forth. That's all it does, and, and, and it spins the uh, the disk. And those programs are for use with head cleaning disks. So yeah, this is actually the best way to clean the heads because it moves that head back and forth across this disk while the disk is spinning. And because only part of the disc is wet with, you know, five drops of this fluid, it's a wet, dry, wet, dry cleaning. 
And it's a very efficient way to not only clean those heads, but keep them nice and polished, nice and smooth, so that they don't scratch your disc. And this is one of the reasons why I never, in, in all the years that I've been using disc drives and discs, I have never had any problems with any of my disc drives or discs. Because I keep them clean, I use nothing but high quality disc drives, and yes, there are low quality disc drives as well. They're usually a lot cheaper. Um, and I used name brand discs. I never used generic discs. I just don't do it. I, 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 you know, I, I usually spent the money, I don't care how much, how much more expensive they were, but I used nothing but name quality, you know, high quality name brand discs. That's what I used. Okay, good quality discs. And so, yeah, I thought I'd show you this, because these, these head cleaning discs like this, these kits, um, they're getting hard to find. They really are. They're getting very hard to find. So I thought I'd show this in this, this video. Well, that's it for this first part of my Apple 2E pickup video series. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, stay tuned for part two, which is coming up next. Um, my name is Hans George Campbell, and until next time.